Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, thanks everyone so much for, for joining us on the first of our AppQuest 3.0 Live Help Series uh, Google Hangouts. The AppQuest competition, as you know, invites developers from around the world to use MTA data as well as other data uh, to make New York, the New York Transit experience better for all of its writers. So I am Serena Petresca. I am here on behalf of Challenge Post. And today we're going to be joined by Erica Hatfield from Transit Wireless, uh, Miko Verkilla from Nimble Devices, and Dan Seedman from Promotional Communications as well. So Miko, Dan, and Erica are going to be talking to us about how to access and use Transit Wireless beacon data in your MTA application. Uh, remember, you aren't required to use the beacon data in order to enter AppQuest 3.0, but since it is available to you and it's a cool new tool, um, we want to make sure that you have all the information necessary to utilize it if you want to. So after Miko's presentation, which will be coming up in just a moment, we're going to be doing some Q&A. Um, there's two ways that you can send in questions to be answered. The first way is to use that Q&A tool that's on the left sidebar of your screen, so you can enter questions in that way. If that doesn't work for you, you can also tweet questions at us via Twitter um, and use the hashtag, hashtag AppQuest um, in your tweet so that we make sure to see it. So um, send it to us via Twitter using the hashtag AppQuest, and then we will moderate it and ask it during this uh, video conference. So we're going to ask as many questions or answer as many questions as we can on the air. And if we don't get to your question or don't know the answer right offhand, uh, we'll be sure to follow up post-event and get all of those questions answered. So with that, I am going to hang, hand over the reins to Miko, uh, who will be walking us through the presentation on how to utilize Beacon Data. Hi, thanks, Serena. Uh, I hopefully you can see my slides. So, yeah, like Serena said, I'm Mikko Virkila from Nimble Devices. We do indoor positioning for mobile apps. And uh, I'll briefly walk you through our how to use our SDK and what the features are and answer any questions you may have. So, uh, the <laughs> as Serena mentioned, our the indoor positioning works off of beacons. So, uh, those are installed at the Grand Central Station now. There's also a data file, which we call an NDD file, which contains information for the positioning. You can drag and drop the indoor guide framework into your project to then receive uh, coordinates, in, uh, triggers, and routes to your application. And internally, we've got, we can also use the gyros, the magnetometers, and the accelerometers uh, to increase the accuracy of the positioning. And the data file is completely independent, so in your app you can either have it on a server of yours or you can have it bundled with the app. That means that the indoor positioning can work uh, even when there's no internet. So there's no server uh, on our side. What you get from the library is that you get not GPS coordinates, of course, you get the latitude, longitude, and altitude, but they use the same interfaces as the as the iOS native uh, sort of GPS APIs. You can also get navigation information like routing, so you can uh, request that a route to a given point of interest and it will calculate it on the phone and give you a list of the points, uh, GPS points and the altitudes between your current location or the user's current location and the requested point of interest. Uh, again, everything on, in our system is basically ma ma marked in the map which from which we generate the map data. So it's uh, in there. It's not something you have to add yourself. Uh, and yeah, you can also a route between floors or levels. And the third way to use the beacons is to use triggers. Uh, which on some platforms are called geofences, but basically they're areas or zones where something happens. And you can use them, they can be either based on the coordinates, so they're marked in the map data, or they can be beacon-based. 
uh, which is similar to how eye beacons work. Basically, you're near a beacon, you get a trigger. Uh, the map data, as mentioned, contains every bit of the information. So that NDD file contains the information required for doing the positioning in GPS coordinates, doing the routing, and doing the triggering. And as the source of that map data, there's a CAD file format called DXF, which is used, and uh, you can edit it using a tool which we is freely available called DraftSight. And that's the sort of the source format. So there is there you have marked all the routes, all the positioning, uh, the beacons, the positioning of them, and the trigger zones. And then the NDD is sort of a compiled format of that CAD file, uh, which is uh, has actually a lot of pre-calculated stuff in it. And uh, the library then you internally uses that NDD to pro to provide you with the the triggers and what have you. So in order to use the framework on iOS, you basically it's three steps. First you set the delegates, and these are the ones which will receive the callbacks from, from the library when it gets a new position, or when the route is calculated or the route changes because you the users wandered off of the route. You set those two you implement and set those two delegates, then you set the data file which you can have either downloaded yourself or included in the app. And then you call start updates. And that will then uh, start causing the callbacks into the positioning delegate and the directions delegates. Uh, yeah, so the positioning delegate is what gives, is uh, basically the same API as you'd have for, for uh, for GPS on iOS. So it calls did update to location uh, with uh, a core location object with those GPS and coordinates set and the altitude set. It gets called once per second with the new position. Uh, if, yeah, that's about it. Uh, for zone triggers, you get uh, Every time you enter a zone or the user enters a zone or exits a zone, you get a callback called did enter zone or did exit zone. Uh, the zones can have a numeric unique ID or then uh, named IDs, for example, top of stairs or uh, exit to Broadway or, or things like this. Uh, the whole idea is that you can also have uh, zones be use the zone names and zones rather than keeping track of GPS coordinates and levels in your own code uh, to make your code simple and then when there's new stations or something all you need to do is replace the or switch from one station's N NDD data file to another station's so if you for example have something happen when the user exits or is near an exit uh, you can have that happen on all the platforms without any changes to your code if you just have a zone called exit and uh, your code handles that trigger. Then for requesting routes, uh, the route is always calculated from the current location to a target. Uh, target is something with a, which is already marked in the map data. So it's not, you cannot give it uh, like latitude and longitude. Instead, you give it, for example, exit, and it will have it will calculate the shortest route to the nearest exit, basically. Or uh, if you have a more specific exit to Broadway target, for example, then it will calculate it to that one, that specific one. Uh, and then the routes to start the routing, it's as simple as start routing to, and then. Uh, when you're when the the calculation is finished, it calls did complete routing, and uh, that actually that did complete routing then contains all the points of between your current location and the target location. So if there's a a floor switch, for example, then the altitude will change mid route, and that's how you know that okay there's a floor switch. Uh, if the user veers off course uh, when we're in this routing mode, uh, it will automatically recalculate the shortest route. Uh, the the route. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Okay, so yeah, so when you have a, since you have a route, for example, between your current location and the exit, uh, what most car navigators and whatnot do is that they then stick the user to that route. So there's that's also available. So the current location projected onto the route. That means it gives a better user ex, uh, user experience than just showing the actual position, which might be a couple of meters off route or something like this. So using the did update route position will give you the your current or the user's current location uh, as if he was following the route perfectly. All right, so just quickly some do's and don'ts. Uh, please use the zones and the triggers. And if there's something you're missing from the map data, please give us feedback. We'll actually handle the editing of the map data for you, so you don't even need to necessarily worry about the how to do that. Just let us know what you require, what type of things you need, and we'll help you along the way. Uh, especially for uh, zones and routes, that's, that is very welcome. Uh, and we'd prefer if you don't re-implement geofencing yourself using GPS coordinates, because then you'll basically it'll only work in one station. And that's not the objective here. Of course, you are free to do that, but we'd recommend against it. Rather use the trigger zones. And please use the Google group for questions, uh, if you have any, so that the, your questions and our answers may benefit the community in, at large. All right, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Awesome, thanks Miko very much. So now it is time for the QA portion of our Hangout. Uh, there are two ways, again, that you can send in questions to be answered. So you can either use that QA tool on the left sidebar of your screen, submit a question that way, or you can tweet a question at us using the hashtag of AppQuest. Um, so again, we're going to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and if we don't know any question or know a question or, or we run out of time, we'll go ahead and answer those off air after uh, the challenge video call ends. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. We do have a few questions in already. Um, the first question that we have is kind of more of an ideas question, and I'll throw this out to the whole panel, which is how can beacons be used in transit apps? Like what are app ideas um, to get people started thinking about utilizing this technology? Um, just to throw a couple things out there, um, aside from the uh, very practical uh, navigational uses, which uh, Miko highlighted in this presentation, where uh, it's very useful to be able to get from one platform to another, or to get from the shuttle uh, to the subway platforms and through the mezzanine in this case, um, one of the fun things that uh, we always thought was uh, to implement some social media into that, so that uh, we can actually implement a more of a find your friend facility so that uh, using socials you can detect um, other users that are in the same environment and actually use the beacon network to navigate uh, people towards each other. That's a really cool use case. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> Anything to add, Miko? I think Dan had, had found a really good one, that this kind of find my friend or something where you'd say that let's meet at the subway station, but then where exactly is sort of always a challenge, and it's a general problem. So the app could send your position, and uh, the app could send your friend's position into a central server, and then you could sort of see each other on the map or, or even have a small arrow pointing that your friend is that way or, or something like this. Yeah, it's a good use case. Fantastic. All right, next question is, how can I most easily gain access to the beacon data? So I know that Miko talked quite a bit about um, how to utilize it once you've got it, um, but what are those very first steps uh, of, of getting at the data? And I think I can kind of answer the first bit of that, which is you sign up for the challenge, register on the challenge post page, and then there is a form on um, the resources page that will allow you to access a wonderfully curated zipped file of information to get started. 
Um, Miko, any tips on what to do with that lovely zipped file of information once it is sitting in your inbox? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, o open it and start playing around with. I believe there's an example app for for the uh, for the subway there. Uh, just trying out different things like testing out how the positioning works in the subway and and uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I think I'm not sure exactly what additional information. Uh, Transit Wireless is providing, like, is there the beacon locations and things like that that I'm not entirely certain of. Uh, if there's some information missing, then just let us know. I'm sure Transit Wireless and us will figure it out. Uh, but yeah, the API documents include this how to get uh, triggers and how to get uh, the position and the routes and so forth. So if that's the kind of data they were looking for, then that's the way to get it. OK, so it sounds like get in there, get messy, see what you can do, and then ask questions if you come up with anything. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Always a good way to find out, discover new things. Perfect. Um, our third question is, uh, what are some pro tips and tricks for working with the Beacon data? So if you were to give people you know, one or two this is definitely what you need to remember when you're working with this data. What would that be? Oh, test in the real environment. Uh, there's in when you deal with beacons, whether it be our system or any other system, there's always the real world throws challenges at you, and uh, it's always good to actually not not just uh, play around at home trying it out, but after you've got something that you want to test actually going out and trying it in the real world because there's always always some surprises with uh, when when dealing with uh, real world situations so for example if you have this cool idea of uh, your find your app then what happens let's say the other person turns off their app uh, as you're navigating to them that your system actually handles that or or let's say you run out of uh, your data plan. Of course, you can use the transit. In this case, you can use the transit wireless Wi-Fi, which is available there. <laughs> always realistic scenarios uh, or real-life scenarios. It's good to test in the real world, because you'll, you'll find some surprises eventually. Very good. Uh, next question is, how close do I have to be to the beacons to pick up a signal? The to pick up a signal, uh, it's now. Let me get this. I'm working usually in metrics, so about a hundred feet uh, should be more than uh, like you can pick it up further away. There's in some scenarios where there's a panel or something, the signal which that will bounce off for a bit longer and so forth. So there's not a fixed uh, distance for how far it will go, how far it will travel. The number of people and everything affects So for a, a given beacon, you can't say that this is exactly how far it is. Because again, you're in a real world scenario. But for the indoor positioning bit, we're picking up multiple beacons and then based on that, we're doing the positioning. So it's not working based on a single beacon. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, it also, so just to add to that, it, it very much depends on the environment. Um, when we look at what we did in uh, Grand Central Station, uh, the mezzanine area, for example, has uh, three to four times as many beacons as the, uh, as the passageway and uh, shuttle platform areas, uh, just because of uh, interference, uh, bounces, objects, uh, low ceilings, and other things. So it's also a case of just mapping out the particular environment based on the uh, line of sight, uh, the inf interference, and uh, any encumbrances that uh, that particular environment has. Thanks, Dan. And that actually leads us right into our next question, which is kind of about where the beacons are available. So for people who are just getting started with this, can you give them a little bit of insight into um, where they need to go to test these things in real life and actually um, utilize them within within their applications? 
Um, sure. Uh, one of the priorities of the MTA and transit wirelessness exercise was to allow uh, mobility for uh, potentially disabled or impaired commuters. So uh, one of the most uh, chaotic areas uh, in the subway network is the mezzanine area of Grand Central Station, uh, where it's uh, the mezzanine combination of the, um, I think, four, five, and six, uh, seven subway lines, as well as the shuttle to uh, the Times Square subway. So that entire mezzanine area, as well as uh, the subway platforms, uh, as well as the entire hallway going out to the Times Square shuttle, uh, have been covered in order to be able to offer uh, seamless navigation between all of the elevators, um, both on the subway platforms and the mezzanine, and also to be able to offer navigation between the multiple exits that are coming off the mezzanine um, to be able to just assist commuters in their um, travel through, through that particular section of the uh, MTA network at this stage. That's great. Uh, okay, so similar, another kind of related question here. We have someone asking, um, what happens to this beacon data after the competition? So we've we've noted in the the competition text that this is uh, a prototyping exercise, and uh, that they're not allowed via the user documents to you know continue to use the data outside of the competition. Um, but what is the plan for uh, the beacons post competition? Uh, I think this is where we hand over to Erica, possibly, um, with uh, discussions with uh, the MTA. But, uh, well, failing that, um, as far as promotional communications and nimble devices are concerned, um, we've got a long-standing relationship with Transit Wireless as far as uh, implementing technology um, on the network uh, on behalf of the MTA. So, I think the idea is that uh, the beacons are currently um, un unlocked uh, for the AppQuest 3.0 AT&T uh, competition. But uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the competition period, what we'll be doing on our side, at least, is um, basically uh, putting a lock or um, an encryption on the beacon network so that only authorized parties are then able to access the beacon libraries and uh, be able to use that network. Um, I think that um, everything else, I don't know if Erica's online now to uh, step in on the transit MTA side. Yes, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, currently at the moment we're just doing a beta test with um, AppQuest using uh, promotional communications and nimble devices. Um, this was kind of a good opportunity for both us and the MTA to just kind of get some ideas around different ways that beacons could be in the subway. Um, so I think we're just going to kind of uh, take this competition as a testing ground and um, hopefully after this competition we'll have some better ideas and maybe do some larger scale testing down the line, but this was kind of just our first stab at it since this is new for both us and the MTA, just to kind of get an idea of um, different things that we could use the technology for utilizing our network and um, and the promotional communication. Thanks, Erica. That's really helpful. Um, we have another question uh, that's kind of Again, really, that everyone is, is working so well off of each other. Um, Migo, this question is directed at you, but uh, please, anyone, feel free to answer. Um, this submitter asks, what are some cool use cases you've seen outside of the transit realm using beacons? So let's say that you know, after the end of this competition, I'm not able to use this specific app anymore um, for the moment, but what could I do using my newfound knowledge about beacons? So we have a one customer, for example, who does museum audio guides. So they have an app for audio guides. And uh, with them, or mainly, they license our technology to be able to provide uh, museum visitors this sort of a free roaming exploratory way of, of finding exhibits in a museum, for example. So rather than you typing in codes or following a tour guide, as you walk with your headset on in the museum, every time you stop and, and look at a painting or a sculpture, it starts automatically to tell you about it. That's a very sort of straightforward uh, use. Uh, another case that we did recently was for, for a big uh, fair. 
where the the challenge is always finding foods you're interested in, or when you have a there's a different kind of of a speakers uh, at different locations. So you could just select one of the the uh, companies presenting there, and it would show you the shortest route to that company. It was a not not a super exciting one, but what was obvious there, very evident fact, was that this find my friend functionality that Dan mentioned could have been invaluable because when you are not looking for a company but you're rather looking for some specific purpose of the person, that could have been very useful at at at, at, at this thing. And uh, again with uh, mobility and uh, and this kind of challenges that the MTA is looking to to solve or, or at least uh, prototype solutions for, they're pretty universal, finding the elevators. It's not just when people are have uh, are disabled, it's uh, also when you have a baby stroller, you need to find an elevator. And <laughs> it's not exactly always that easy. So this kind of improving mobility of people is, is a very generic problem, uh, not specific to the MTA. Thanks. That's a really good answer. Ricard, Dan, anything to add to that? Well, the beacons uh, can also be used um, in conjunction with other mobile tools. Uh, we actually uh, present quite a few brand activation apps over the course of the year. And a couple um, of the integrations that we'll be using Most beacons even. as far as uh, general commercial or brand activation apps so is, uh, uh, for example, there's a, a golf club uh, manufacturer called TaylorMade. Uh, they're uh, present in Dick's Sporting Goods shops. Uh, we'll be implementing beacon networks uh, in Dick's Sporting Goods shops so that people with the uh, tailor-made app can actually easily find tailor-made products and pull up information on those products. Um, another view that we're taking is to combine augmented reality or virtual reality with the beacon network. Uh, because um, when you're looking through your phone uh, within a beacon network and your phone is offering you navigation, it doesn't necessarily mean that what you see through your phone has to be reality. Uh, an example could be uh, when we think of the mezzanine of Grand Central Station, just because you're being guided towards uh, a corner where an elevator is present doesn't mean that you have to see that elevator through your phone's camera display. You could just as easily be seeing a winter wonderland where there's uh, Santa's Grotto near Elevator 1, um, where there are reindeers near Elevator 2, and where if you'd like to have a photo taken with an elf, um, that the elves are all hanging out by the, um, by the shuttle platform. Um, so um, it's very much just another tool that could be used in the mobile um, app ecosystem in order to um, help guide people and also provide experiences, um, achieve very useful goals like uh, guiding people to where they are, but also achieve commercial goals like uh, present products or uh, give people information about retail. I love those use cases. Those are very fun. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on, um, we have another question asking, do you know of any other cities that have existing beacon technology working in a transit system? And if so, how has it been received? Uh, we did some research before implementing um, the uh, initial beacon trials with Transit Wireless. And as far as we can see, um, this is the first beacon implementation that has been done in a uh, subway system um, globally at this stage, I believe. OK, awesome. Um, another kind of logistical question. When testing the beacons in Grand Central, uh, and someone who works there comes up, to, comes up to us and asks us what we're doing, what do we tell them? Do they know about the contest? Are they going to kick us out? <laughs> Um, I think having spent quite a lot of time actually installing the beacons with Nico in the station, um, I think the, and Erica, I'll uh, let step in as far as uh, official MTA policy, but um, the um, MTA subway network is open 24 hours a day. Um, you need to have a subway ticket in order to access the mezzanine platforms and uh, shuttle areas. So um, as far as we understand, anyone who's got a valid ticket to travel um, is allowed into the mezzanine area 24-7. 
Uh, and, um, you know, as long as um, traffic and uh, people aren't being obstructed or, um, you know, general general usage of the network's not being impeded, uh, I think people at this stage are encouraged uh, to, you know, wander around the mezzanine uh, shuttle areas and platforms and uh, really see um, how their apps are working and functional. Um, I'll hand over to Erica for some more specific detail. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dan pretty much nailed it. Um, uh, he, he pretty covered, um, you know, yeah, as long as you're not, you know, impending or hindering the flow of traffic, um, you know, the MTA supports this competition and this technology. So, um, you know, we welcome the app developers to go down and, you know, test out what they're developing using the technology. Okay, so it sounds like feel free to test, just don't cause a scene. Sounds good. <laughs> um, all right, so our next question is, does the root file give a location, <clears throat> excuse me, does the root file give a location on where the beacons are? Um, so like beacon A is in Grand Central, beacon B is in Times Square. How much information is given on that root file? So actually, uh, our system does not give out the information of where the individual beacon is located. Uh, so that is some that information you would need to get from uh, transit wireless. Um, I think the idea is that the exact beacon locations are um, not necessary to be learned for the, to be known to the public. The NDD files and the mapping that was created um, are easily able to be uploaded using the APIs and the SDKs. Um, and then finally, uh, I think there's just a, a small security theft vandalism issue roped into this, um, which is that uh, the network works great and uh, using the software provided, uh, the navigation will be available, but um, we don't necessarily want people uh, walking around um, identifying the beacon locations and, and as I said, that's probably uh, with a bit of theft, vandalism, and uh, security thrown in there. Great. I think that answered that question. Um, so we've just got one more on my list here. So if there are any other questions um, from the audience that's listening now, I do encourage you to throw them out via the QA screen or tweet them at us now so that we can answer them on air. Otherwise, we will certainly uh, take note of those after the presentation and get them answered for you as quickly as possible. Um, so with that, I will start with our, our last question here, um, which is a little bit more logistical, so I might be able to answer it myself, but the question is, is there a special prize for making a beacon-enabled application? Um, and so I'll, I'll start off with the answer to this one. There is no specific special prize for making a beacon app for AppQuest 3.0. We do have a prize track specifically designed um, to be to enable apps that are more accessible um, for uh, disabled MTA customers or um, people who might need a bit more help with accessibility in the transit system. So there is a specific track for that. It happens to fit pretty well with the technology that is being offered here. However, you are not required to use Beacon Technology to compete in that track. So um, there is not a specific prize. That said, you can also potentially use Beacon Technology in an app that is not designed for the accessibility track. So this is simply a tool to you know, help you make the best transit applications possible um, and really kind of help MTA and Transit Wireless look at the possibility of using them more widely um, in years to come. Anything to add, Erica, Dan, or Miko, to that question? No. OK. Um, well, it doesn't look like I got any more questions in during that little spiel. So um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and conclude our Beacon Live Help Series Hangout. Uh, I really want to thank all of our presenters and all of our viewers for joining us. Um, we really appreciate their time and effort making all of this possible. And for those who are watching, please make sure to register for the challenge so you can stay up to date on all the challenge happenings, get information, find out when these videos are posted um, so that you can review them diligently after the event. Uh, and you can do that by going to the challenge website, which is mtaappquest.com. 
appquest.com. So mtaappquest.com. Go click register. Uh, and don't forget that the deadline is February 3rd. Um, so you need to submit your applications before that time. Final thing that I want to say is a little plug from the MTA team. They wanted to make sure to remind you all that if you are planning to use an MTA asset or a trademark, like a subway sign or a map or an icon, you'll need to apply for a license in order to do that. It's not a hard thing to do, and there are instructions on the challenge website about how to do it, but make sure you do that early so you don't have anything riding over your head at the end. All right, so with that, thanks so much again to everybody. We really enjoy working with you all, and we're very excited to see what all you viewers out there submit. And we will talk to you all again with another Google Hangout in a few weeks. Thank you, Serena. You bet. Thanks, Nico. Thanks, Serena. <laughs>